It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of the Official Opposition. Speaker. Speaker, my first question is to the Premier. The federal government announced their intention to legalize cannabis over three years ago. There's only one province in Canada not ready. When will the government have legislation in place to regulate its sale and distribution? Premier. <laughs> For you, Mr. Speaker. Matter of fact, Ontario is one of the only provinces that are ready. They handled well over 38,000 orders last night. I give all the kudos to the great team that we have here and the Ontario Cannabis Store. They did a great job. Matter of fact, the Leader of the Opposition has to know they stayed up all night working to fulfill the orders, and I'm very, very proud of them. Here, here. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, I'll remind the Premier that legislation has yet not passed and it became legal at midnight last night, Speaker. Municipalities, local police, educators have been looking to this government Order. for a plan to deal with this huge change. And the government had all summer to prepare, but instead of preparing, this government spent the summer debating how many wards Toronto City Council should have. Why didn't the Premier make getting cannabis legalization right a priority? Well, I just have to remind the Leader of the Opposition through you, Mr. Speaker, it was the federal government that dumped this on our shoulders, dumped it on the, on the country, didn't give the police the tools they needed. They didn't give the police the tools they needed, as I addressed yesterday with the OPP. Yep. Our job is to make sure we protect the children, Absolutely. protect neighbourhoods, keep it away from schools, keep it away from parks and hospitals. We gave the authority to the municipalities if they don't want anyone smoking uh, marijuana, cannabis in their area, they'll vote against it. And they can literally make it impossible for anyone to smoke cannabis in their area if they opted out. Here, here. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, instead of prioritizing this issue, this Premier dumped on Toronto all summer. That's right. Instead of prioritizing this issue. For a change, this, government si this come to significant order. for a change this significant, Speaker, the government could have made it a top priority. Yep. Instead, we have a government scrambling to pass laws for a substance that is already legal, launching an education campaign hours before before people can legally light up. And a premier here says you can smoke in parks, while his attorney general says that you can. Says he, who he says you can't, but she says you can. The Premier wants to blame everybody but himself. Why did he not make this his priority? Premier? Already. Law. Through you, Mr. Speaker, I missed the first part of uh, the rebuttal from the Leader of the Opposition, but the legislation is passing today. We did a great job once again, and our number one priority is to make sure our children are safe. Make sure we keep it away from schools. Make sure we let the municipalities decide if they're going to even sell it, where they can smoke cannabis. That's what I'm proud of. I'm proud of our great team down here and the Ontario Cannabis Store. They did a great job. Members take their seats. Next question, Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My next question is also for the Premier. You know, Ontario's police have been working around the clock to prepare uh, for the legalization of cannabis, and I, and on behalf of all of my uh, NDP members in this caucus and the official, as the official opposition, want to commend them for working so hard for doing that. And, and in fact, they say they're ready. However, yesterday the Premier said they're not ready. Which is it? Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker, I'm glad the Leader of the Opposition and her whole team have a different outlook about the police than they did during the election. Exactly. They had a big sign running around, F the police. Yep. They're police haters. That's what the NDP are. They don't like our police. Resistance. I support her. I can ask the Premier to withdraw. Withdraw. Supplementary. <laughs> Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. 
Back to the Premier Speaker. What we're hearing from police is that the real confusion has been caused by a government that still doesn't have legislation in place. The Premier spent his summer holding weeks of debate, even through the night, as we all recall, Speaker, to fight his old enemies from his old job at Toronto City Hall. But the legislation needed to deal with this major change is being rushed through, with almost no public hearings whatsoever. And it still isn't ready. Why is this not his priority, Speaker? Where, where is it, uh, the three bears? I don't get the logic. Well, through you, Mr. Speaker, I've traveled across the province, talked to almost every police department in the province, OPP, Toronto, Peel, York, so on and so forth. I can tell you, they support our government more than they've ever supported any government. They, they love what we're doing. They love they finally have a friendly voice down at Queen's Park. Rather than being attacked by the NDP constantly, being attacked by the Liberals, throwing out Bill 175 attacking the police, we're, we stand shoulder to shoulder with all law enforcement across this province. Members, take their seats. Final supplementary. Well, sticks and stones, Premier. People expect their government to have laws and a plan in place to keep their children safe and protect people's rights. Instead, they see Liberals in Ottawa and Tories at Queen's Park pay playing the blame game. This Premier wants to blame everyone but himself. We've known for three years that this was coming. Why is this Premier of all Premier Speaker still scrambling to get ready? Premier. <laughs> through, through you, Mr. Speaker. Oh, boy, because you guys are a bunch of jokers. That's why I'm smiling. <laughs> anyway, through you, Mr. Speaker. Through the resistance. <laughs> Chaos. Through, through you, Mr. Speaker. Again, I will repeat what I've kept saying over and over again. Our priority. Our priority is to make sure our children are safe. Our priority is to make sure we give the powers to the, the municipalities to make a decision to either opt in or opt out. And again, we stand shoulder to shoulder with our police. Unlike the NDP, they don't stand shoulder to shoulder with our police. They want to attack our police. I can tell you, our police are informed, our police are ready, and we will do everything we can to make sure this is a smooth transition. Yeah. Next question, the Leader of the Opposition. So I'm going to go to the Minister of Community uh, Safety, Speaker, and maybe he won't throw the same sticks and stones as the Premier likes to throw. Can the Minister tell us, as of right now, at this very moment in time, what Order. law police are enforcing in this province with regard to marijuana use? Minister of Community Thank Safety you. and Correctional Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thanks for the question. First of all, our police are ready to go. We've invested time and energy into ensuring that they're able to do their jobs, and they are able to do their jobs. Our ministry is committed to making sure that we work with the police to make sure that they have the tools to do what they need to do. And our top priority has been from the beginning, not three years ago, but less than 120 days ago, to ensure that they had the tools that they needed to be able to do their jobs. And we're confident, we are confident that they are able to do their jobs effectively. Well said. Members, please take your seats. Supplementary. Speaker, you know, the police say that they're ready. The minister says that they're ready. The premier doesn't think that they're ready. It's really pretty confusing out there. And it becomes worse when last night a memo was sent to chiefs of police across Ontario stating that as of right now, the law of the land is still the Liberal legislation. This is causing even more confusion than what the Premier is causing. Police are doing their best to prepare for this significant change, and as I've said, we're very uh, grateful for the hard work that they've done, but this government is raising more questions than it answers. What law are police supposed to be enforcing as of right this moment, Speaker? Minister. 
Mr. Speaker, we have been very clear that our priority as a government is to ensure that our children are safe, that our streets are safe, and that we remove illegal sales of marijuana. And that is what our police are doing. They have the tools. They are doing their jobs, and we fully support them because this government, unlike the opposition, has made public safety a priority and supporting the police forces that enforce our laws. That's what we've done. That's what we're doing, and we're going to continue to support the police. Members, please take your seats. Next question. The member for Etobicoke Lakeshore. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Mr. Speaker, there continues to be another a number of concerns in my riding of Etobicoke Lakeshore and from Ontarians across the province regarding the ability to keep our communities and streets safe after the federal Liberal government decided to rush through with the legalization of cannabis. Speaker, there are simply many Ontarians, including many families, who are concerned about what the legalization of cannabis will look like in Ontario. Minister, can you please explain to the members of this legislature what your ministry is doing to ensure our communities can remain safe now that the federal government has legalized cannabis? Mr. Community Safety and Correctional Services. Mr. Speaker, thank you, and uh, thank you to the member of Etobicoke Lakeshore for that question. Mr. Speaker, as we all know, the federal government's legalization of cannabis is now in effect. Many Ontarians and their families will look to the hardworking and dedicated members of our police services to help keep the communities safe. Our government remains committed to tackling organized crime in this province, and we will ensure that our police services have the necessary tools to shut down the illegal cannabis market in the province. Absolutely. The men and women of our police services are the ones who will be taking the risks that are necessary for keeping the great people of this province safe. These brave men and women didn't ask for this challenge. They have the challenge and they're dealing with the challenge that was put forward to them by the federal government. I can assure you, though, however, and all members of the legislature, that our government Bonds. or the people will do everything in our power to ensure our floodlight officers have the tools they need to be able to provide the services to the province. Here, here. Supplementary. Speaker, I thank the minister for his response. Our dedicated frontline and emergency responders work very hard putting their lives on the line day in and day out to keep our cities and streets safe. I know the minister will continue to work with our government's policing partners so Ontario's communities can remain safe. Speaker, with the federal government having rushed the legalization of cannabis, Ontarians deserve to feel confident in their own safety and safety of their families. Ontarians need to know that our government is listening and taking action to combat the legal cannabis market. Could the minister please update the members of this legislature on how our government, for the people, is ensuring that this province takes a responsible and safe approach to the sale of cannabis? Minister. Thank you for the follow-up question. And I want to begin by recognizing and thanking our premier, the Attorney General, the Minister of Transportation and the Minister of Finance for the incredible job they've done in such a short period of time. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, our government's top priority remains protecting Ontario families, their children, and ensuring road safety and combating the illegal cannabis market. As of today, Mr. Speaker, the only legal place to buy cannabis in Ontario is through the online Ontario Cannabis Store website. Mm -hmm. Starting today, Mr. Speaker, the numerous illegal dispensaries that are operating in many parts of the province will remain illegal. I want to Spons. ensure all members of the legis this legislature that our government for the people will be working closely with the men and women of the province to ensure that illegal cannabis markets are closed. Thank you very much. 
Next question, the member for Hamilton West, Ancaster Dundas. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question this morning is for the Minister of Finance. Uh, yesterday, the Financial Accountability Office declared that this government's cancellation of the cap and trade would result in the loss of three billion dollars over the next four years. Wow. Can the finance minister please tell us how this shortfall will impact the $15 billion deficit that the Campbell report recently discovered? Minister of Finance. Minister of Energy. Uh, I'm sorry, Minister of Environment. Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Oh, so excited. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, th through, through you to the uh, member, and thank you for the question. Um, it, is kind of, it is something to hear the, uh, the party opposite talk about the deficit, to talk about, about accountability. The fact that we're even aware there's a $15 billion deficit is because the government made it clear to the people of Ontario that we were going to be transparent, and we were going to make sure that the taxpayers understood <laughs> the state of the province's finances. But to the, to, the, to the question, we made a promise to the people of Ontario that we would get rid of the regressive job-killing cap-and-trade program. Clearly, that was going to reduce revenues to the government. We think that's a good thing because it puts money back into taxpayers' pockets. $264 a year for every family. We're proud of that. That's a commitment we made. That's a commitment we'll keep. Stop the clock. Start the clock. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, any savings this government claims it will achieve in cancelling this program will be more than negatively impacted by the cancellation, by the substantial loss in revenue that this cap and trade would have generated for this province. So I ask the finance minister up front. Government benches come to order. Please tell Ontarians government what he's benches come to order. To to make up for the free, this $3 billion hole in the budget this budget has created. Premier, come to order. <laughs> Minister. Mr. Speaker, through you to the member. Mr. Speaker, there's just a difference between our point of view. That's all. We don't believe that every dollar the government gets is a dollar that is best spent. We think the dollars that are best spent oh. are in taxpayers' money. Yeah. The people of Ontario understood that. That's why they put our government into the position it's in. That's why we're the government, because they know they can spend their dollars better. We will address climate change. We will bring forward a climate plan, a balanced plan that deals with the issues. But it will not be done at the expense of average Ontario families. $264 may not be a lot of money to you. It's a lot of money to average Ontario families. We're going to give it to them. Members, please take your seats. Order. Restart the clock. Next question, the member for Brampton West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Finance. Uh, we, we have been hearing a lot about fairness in the auto insurance system. It is clear action should have been taken a long time ago to support drivers in Ontario. While it's unfortunate the Liberals did nothing more than offer empty promises, it's encouraging now to see the work being done in our caucus. The private member's bill introduced on Monday by the member from Milton moves us forward in developing an auto insurance system that is fair and serves the needs of drivers across Ontario. Could the minister please explain the importance of combating rate discrimination in Ontario's auto insurance industry? Minister Finance. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from uh, Brampton West for the question. Let's be clear, rate discrimination is simply unfair. A good driver in Toronto should not have to pay more for insurance than a good driver anywhere else in the province. This is about fairness. This is about building an insurance system that works for drivers. This is about taking action the Liberals, backed by the NDP, never did do. 
I look forward to working with the member from Milton and other stakeholders across the industry to bring more fairness, finally, to the auto insurance system. Over 10 million drivers in Ontario are counting on us, Speaker. They've been ignored far too long. It's about time someone started working for the people. Yeah. Start the clock. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister. As a longtime advocate for lower auto insurance premiums, I'm proud to stand with a government that is finally taking action for the people of Brampton and Ontario. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Red discrimination is an unfair practice that we must take action against. I'm pleased the member from Milton's private member's bill seeks to, if passed, address this issue across the entire province. Ontario's drivers deserve, deserve more fairness in their system. They deserve an auto insurance system that works for them. Right. Moving forward, we must continue to build a robust auto insurance system that serves the needs of drivers. Could the minister please reiterate our government's commitment as we develop improvements to our auto insurance system? Okay. Minister. Thank you, Speaker. Our government is committed to developing a system that puts the drivers first. We are committed to fairness in rate setting. We are committed to ending discriminatory practices. And we are committed to taking action where the Liberals never did. The Liberal NDP failed attempt to provide relief on auto insurance is broken beyond repair. We must look for thoughtful ideas across the entire regulatory system in order to find improvements. Thoughtful ideas like those found in the plan put forward by the member from Milton yesterday. His legislation, if passed, will bring more fairness to the system, allowing the auto insurance system to better serve drivers. Drivers across Ontario are grateful for his leadership on this file. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Brampton East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Finance. Ending postal code discrimination in auto insurance rates has been a long standing priority of the NDP. That's why I introduced my bill to end unfair practice of uh, postal code discrimination that is hurting my community of Brampton and communities across the GTA. I am committed to ending this practice. The NDP is committed to ending this practice. But the government is only playing lip service to this very important issue. Mr. Speaker, if the government was truly serious about ending postal code discrimination in auto insurance, then why didn't the government put forward legislation instead of put forward a private member's bill? Minister of Finance. Thank you, uh, Speaker. It's clear, it's very clear, in fact, it's crystal clear that the uh, Liberal NDP system of failed stretch goals on auto insurance is absolutely broken. And the member from Brampton East, uh, I would say, welcome to the party, better late than never, but it's not even better late. It's not good. The member from Brampton East wants the GTA to be considered a single geographic area when insurance companies set their rate. However, this will only serve to increase insurance costs across the entire GTA. In fact, the member's plan would cause rates to rise in many of his own caucus colleagues' own ridings. I wonder if you even caucused your own caucus on your idea before you rushed it in uh, yesterday. On the other hand, our member from from Milton Fonts. got it absolutely right. He yes. took time to consult with and to listen and to develop a plan that will deliver fairness. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, yesterday I tabled a bill that, if passed, will not only end postcode discrimination in auto insurance, but will also hold insurance companies to account. 
Drivers in areas like Brampton, Scarborough, and Jane and Finch will no longer be gouged for the rates that they pay, and insurance companies will no longer be allowed to offer or renew discriminatory insurance contracts. But standing in the way of this, Mr. Speaker, is a government that in July approved a 9% increase in auto insurance rates for drivers. Yeah. 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 Mr. Speaker, how can the government, in good conscience, say that they're trying to bring down rates on one hand and then increase rates on the other? Yeah. Yeah. Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Well, I realize the uh, member did file a bill yesterday, so not only is he literally a day late, he's many, many, many dollars short, Speaker. His bill will serve to increase insurance costs across the entire GTA, something that he and the Liberal Party know very well. Prefer in the water, deal that they order. concocted back in Member 2013, Speaker, in order to pass the Liberal budget, the NDP supported this, and Speaker, none of it has ever happened. It was a stretch goal, to use the Premier's words, backed up by the, Lib by the NDP party, Speaker. So we will not be taking any lessons, especially a day late and a few dollars short from that member. Thank you. Next question, the member for Don Valley West. Mr. Speaker, my, spe my question is for the Minister of Education. Um, Mr. Speaker, the, uh, I had an opportunity to meet with the Ontario Public School Boards Association representatives this morning, and I know the minister has had a chance to meet with some of them. And first, I just want to do a shout out to all the candidates in Ontario who are running for school trustee on Monday. I wish them luck, and everybody needs to go out and vote for their school trustee. I have a feeling, if I had a crystal ball, I have a feeling trustees are going to be really important over the next few years. Mr. Speaker, um, I want to just ask, there is a group that is called the Partnership Table, Mr. Speaker, that has been in existence for many years. It is school board representatives, parent representatives, teachers, support staff, uh, caretaker staff, Mr. Speaker, um, all of whom have input into legislation, have input into uh, budget priorities on an ongoing basis. I want to ask the Minister of Education, Mr. Speaker, what the partnership table has met since the new government has been elected. Minister of Education. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the question, but I think we have to make sure that we understand what we inherited. When that member opposite was a trustee, she destroyed the school board that she was in. Oh. So, Speaker, the, the bottom line to all of this is we are being very thoughtful in how we move forward and work with our partners in a thoughtful way, and we're encouraging everyone. And I might say, Speaker, I'm going to use this opportunity to remind all the partners that the member referenced to participate in our consultation. Yeah. We're off to a great start, Speaker, and I encourage everyone that wants to have their voice heard at this time in terms of making a difference and helping us determine the path forward to Spons. clean up the mess that we inherited, uh, get involved. For the parents, .ca. Start the clock. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, so I'll take that as a no. Mr. Speaker, I know that um, there is a consultation, an online consultation on cell phones in classrooms and on math curriculum and on the health and physical education curriculum. But, Mr. Speaker, what, uh, what we are hearing is that many, many initiatives have stopped. So the curriculum writing on social studies, First Nations curriculum, Mr. Speaker, the um, uh, equity and inclusive education policies, those discussions, Mr. Speaker. So there are a lot of initiatives that have stopped. My concern, Mr. Speaker, is that the partnership table was a place for all of the uh, representatives within the education sector who were tapped into their communities, whether it was trustees or whether it was uh, education workers or whether it was parents, Mr. Speaker, to come together and talk to the government about priorities on budget, Mr. Speaker. So the partnership table was part of a broader consultation in the lead up to example. For example, Mr. Speaker, to the fall economic statement or the budget. Question. I would ask the Minister of Education what is the plan for a broad consultation with all of those partnerships, partners, and whether the partnership table will be part of that in the lead up to the fall economic statement yeah. and the budget. Thank you. Minister, the mess you made in education. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, our number one priority is making sure that we clean up the mess that we inherited. Need I remind here, the here. member? received the EQAO results last week and their math scores of their students, their yeah. children in the schools that this Liberal, previous Liberal government was responsible for have failed dismally with sure. EQAO. And so we're going to fix that as well. That's what we're talking about. And that's what we're wanting to hear from every single person in this province about through our consultation. And I'm really pleased to share with you, Speaker, that in two short weeks, we're hearing from thousands of people that are taking time to submit written submissions on job skills, on life skills, on testing, on STEM on health and physical education, on making a better path for students because they know over the last 15 years our students went completely off the rail. Thank you. Thank you. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Flamborough, Glanbrook. Uh, my question today is for the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. With recreational cannabis being legalized today, there have been numerous concerns regarding the federal government's approved roadside tests to ensure that Ontario's streets remain safe for those who choose to drive while impaired. Speaker, the Premier wrote a letter to the federal government yesterday stating that the federal government has left the hardworking men and women of our police services without the necessary tools and support they need to reliably test for impaired driving. With Don't cannabis lie. now legalized by the federal government, can the minister please explain to the members of this legislature how this government will keep our community safe from those who drive while impaired? Thank you. Thank you. Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And thank you to the member for, from Flamborough-Glanbrook for that uh, question. Mr. Speaker, I want to assure the members of this legislature and all Ontarians that we're committed to working with our policing partners to ensure they have the necessary tools and resources to enforce the federal legislation, the legalization of cannabis. One of our government's top priorities remains protecting our children, ensuring road safety, and combating illegal cannabis sales in the province. The fact remains that the federal government had three years to act and failed to do the work required to ensure our communities and streets could remain safe after the legalization of cannabis. In fact, the federal government has only approved one device for use for roadside cannabis testing, one that makes it completely impractical to operate in a police cruiser. In addition, this device has a number of problems associated with it, including numerous Lots. reported failures when utilized in temperatures below zero. Our government will continue to work to ensure. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and back to the minister. While the lack of action from the federal Liberal government is concerning, I know that my constituents in Flamborough Glanbrook are comforted knowing that our government for the people is taking impaired driving seriously. Here, here. Yep. Sadly, we know that people are willing to risk the lives of others and make the choice to get behind the wheel while they are under the influence. Minister, while the federal Liberal government continues to be unprepared, what proactive measures is this government taking to make sure that our roads stay safe and that those who break the law are punished. Great question. Minister. To the Minister of Transportation. Mr. Transportation. Well, thank you very much, Speaker, and I thank my colleague from uh, Flamborough Glanbrook for the question. Our ministry, our government, is taking a two pronged approach. First of all, early this, uh, earlier this year, we instituted a zero tolerance policy for young and novice drivers and commercial drivers when it comes to the presence of drugs in their system. We've also launched a very comprehensive public education campaign so that we can uh, educate the public on the dangers of driving while under the influence of cannabis. It is one thing we want to make absolutely clear to the people out there. There are misconceptions, but we want to make one thing absolutely clear. Impaired is impaired. Impaired is impaired, whether it's by alcohol or drugs, and our ministry is making Bonds. sure that we have 
educated the people, a two-pronged approach, because we want our highways to be safe. It's our number one priority. Here, here. Thank you very much. Well said. Thank you. Next question, the member for Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, the Ministry of Education's Parents Reaching Out grants provide modest but very important support to school councils for projects that engage with parents who may experience barriers to participation in their child's education. Now, with the school term nearing the halfway mark, school councils are in the dark about the status of their planned events, and some have been told the funding is under review. Can the minister tell us why her government is delaying approval of the Parents Reaching Out grants for 2018-19? Education. Well, thank you very much for that question. And, Speaker, through you to the member opposite, I want to remind everyone in this House that we are keeping a promise we made during the election, and that is we're respecting parents. And I think the first step in respecting parents is being responsible with their precious tax dollars. And so while we're embarking on this consultation, which has far surpassed that dismal 1,638 responses the former Liberal government generated we are actually listening to parents and so as we embark on a new path forward for Ontario education curriculum, we've hit the pause button in some instances because we want to make sure we're getting our investments right. So to those of the, the parents who are listening today, I suggest to them, we want to hear from you. We Response. want to hear your priorities. We want to hear your concerns. And go to the fortheparents.ca and participate in this very unique consultation. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, Minister, the, through you, Mr. Speaker, to the Minister, this is a very straightforward question about a program that parents and communities are concerned about right now. And it sounds to me actually like the priority or the first step, as you said, for your government is actually to cut funding for parent councils um, from events focused on math skills to workshops on raising emotionally healthy kids. The Parents Reaching Out grants have served to connect parents with their school communities. Some of these programs have already registered hundreds of parents, and the school councils have applied in good faith following the ministry's process. Now they could be left with nothing. Yet another example of this government changing the rules in the middle of the game. Can the minister explain why this parent engagement funding is being withheld from parents Question. wanting to be involved in their kids' education, or is the for the parents just another empty slogan? Speaker, well, okay. Please take your seats. Minister. Well, Speaker, I have every confidence that that narrative that member on the opposite side of the uh, House is trying to create is not going to stick at all. Because, again, when we start hearing from our parents that we're on the right track, that Opposition they're appreciative that they're really being heard, and that they're appreciative that we're respecting hard earned precious tax dollars. Remember We're hitting the pause button until this consultation is finished, and I would think that that member opposite would be well advised, instead of creating turmoil, encourage her order. people to get involved in the consultation so Remember that we can get involved order. in a thoughtful way and Order. Order. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Perry Sound, Muskoka. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks. Speaker, our government has been clear we are opposed to any tax that will impact the hardworking people of Ontario. By threatening to impose their carbon tax, the federal Liberal government highlighted their lack of concern for Ontarians. The former provincial Liberal government's regressive job-killing cap-and-trade carbon tax caused hydro bills to spike and gas prices to rise. The NDP on several occasions have stood up in this legislature and defended the Liberal cap-and-trade carbon tax, making it clear that they do not intend on making life easier for Ontarians either. With the release of the FAO's financial review of the cancellation of the cap-and-trade, can the minister explain to us how our government 
under the leadership of Premier Ford, Question. will benefit Ontarians by cancelling the cap and trade hey. carbon tax. Yeah. Environment, Conservation, and Parks. Mr. Speaker, through you to the member. Uh, under the leadership of Premier Ford, um, throughout the campaign, we were very clear. We were going to get rid of cap and trade, and we were going to fight the carbon tax. We were going to do that because we believe there are more effective ways to protect our environment, but we were going to do that as well because we want to put money back into the pockets of Ontario families. The FAO report that the member references made it clear yesterday—$264 per family, a, a $1.3 billion reduction. Uh, we see this as good. The opposition sees this as a lost revenue to the government. We see this as found revenue to families. Here, here. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, our Premier has made it clear. We are going to do everything we can to make life more affordable in Ontario. This is just one step, and we are going to make sure it gets done. Supplementary. Speaker, uh, through you back to the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks. It's clear that on this side of the House, we truly do have the people of Ontario in mind when making each and every decision. The FAO report highlights some great benefits for Ontarians. However, it also highlights the negative impacts that the federal backstop will have. My constituents are worried. Should the Trudeau carbon tax be imposed in Ontario, it will have a profound impact. Ontarians cannot afford a carbon tax. Ontarians are tired of paying inflated hydro bills and gas prices, and small business owners are struggling. Can the Minister of Environment describe how our government will fight the Trudeau carbon tax? Minister. Mr. Speaker, through you to the member. For months on end, the opposition in Ottawa has risen in the House and asked questions about the Trudeau carbon tax. They've been faced with non-answers, redacted documents. Some have said a carbon tax cover-up. How much is the Trudeau carbon tax going to cost? Well, yesterday, Mr. Speaker, we got an answer. We got an answer from the FAO. $648 a year, Mr. Speaker. In four short years, $648 a year. That's the price of four hydro bills. Too much for Ontario families, too much for Canadian families. That's why, with the leadership of our Premier, other Premiers are coming together, six now, to talk about alternatives, to talk about killing the Trudeau carbon tax. We will do everything in our power to fight this regressive job-killing carbon Response. tax. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Verna Gingrich is a senior in Kitchener Centre. Verna lives with compression on the spine, and unfortunately, a surgery resulted in serious nerve damage. In 2017, she was assessed to receive two hours of basic home care each day. She relies on this care to shower, dress, help open or partially open items, and prepare for her days. Without it, she's trapped in her apartment. Inconsistent scheduling and changes to scheduled PSW appointments leave Verna's life in a state of chaos. Since 2017, Verna has had over 250 personal support workers assist with her personal care. This is virtually, there is virtually no continuity of care, and seniors like Verna are suffering. What measures will this government take to ensure that heartbreaking stories like Verna's aren't the norm? Premier. Minister of Tourism. Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Thank you. You know, the, the example you raised today is one that, frankly, all of us have heard. The, the inconsistency that we see in the health care that is provided, uh, particularly as it relates to home care, is a real issue for our government. And we've made some commitments to try to fix that system. We're, we're 110 days in. I trust that you will give us the time to make this happen and make it right because we can't rush decisions we can't keep doing the same thing over and over and expect different results we are doing this carefully in a measured way our minister of health is is more uh, qualified to do this than anyone as i can, i can imagine as a former patient advocate order 
we want to do it right, so we need to, the time Lawrence. to make sure that that happens. Here, here, here. Good. Supplementary. Uh, back to the Premier. This past summer, Verna received notice that her daily care time was going to be further reduced to only half an hour in the morning. Shame. Verna and her children advocated against this initial time reduction, yet the private company recently ordered another assessment to see if they could reduce her care further. Again, the occupational therapist determined that Verna needs the daily hour and a half of personal care. Verna needs these exercises so that she can become more independent. Does the Premier think it's right for a private company to prevent Verna from getting the care she needs by overriding the recommendations of health care professionals? Good question. Minister? You know, I, I trust that as an MPP, you are actively engaged with conversations with the CCAC. I know in my own constituency office, and I'm sure in many of ours, we spend a lot of our time making sure that the people who need the service are getting it. It is inappropriate for decisions to be made, and to pit private and public is wrong, because the point is the CCACs are making the decisions about how much care is needed That's and right. when that will happen. Right. I would encourage you, and if you need some help with that, we're happy to help, um, oh, to yeah. deal with the CCAC directly and make sure that those cuts are not happening, because they certainly are not happening from this government. Thank you. Next question, the member for Glengarry Prescott Russell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The question is for the Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Yesterday, the Canadian Union of Postal Workers informed Canada Post that rotating strikes will begin on October 22 if a new agreement cannot be reached. Many Ontarians rely on Canada Post each and every day to receive important government services, programs and documentation. From social assistance programs to birth and death certificates, these services are vital to the people of Ontario. While the federal government battles with the postal workers, can the Minister of Government and Consumer Services please update the Legislature on our government's plan uh, should a postal strike occur? Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Uh, thanks, Mr. Speaker, and thanks uh, to my honourable colleague for the question this morning. Our government recognizes that a Canada Post strike could cause inconveniences uh, for many Ontarians. We hope that the federal government can reach a deal with the Canadian postal workers. But in the meantime, I want to assure the people of Ontario that we are ready. We've been working collaboratively government-wide to minimize the impact on critical government services and programs. We've launched Ontario.ca slash mail. That's Ontario.ca slash mail to provide information to the people of Ontario. A contingency plan is ready should alternative delivery processes be deemed necessary. We also recognize that many Ontarians still receive social assistance and other government payments through Canada Post, and we encourage those that are receiving checks. Uh, via Canada Post to sign up for direct deposit if Response. they haven't done so already, and we're committed to ensuring Ontarians get their access to critical Ontario government services. Like the voice Thank, you. Say, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his response. I'm happy to hear that our government planned ahead for this possibility and has a clear plan in place to ensure the people of Ontario can still access their services. Uh, I'm sure many of us are also wondering how this potential postal strike will affect the Ontario Cannabis Store, given the federal government's decision to legalize cannabis in this country. With today being the first day Ontarians are able to order cannabis from the OCS online store, many will have questions about how their product will reach their doors. Could the minister please explain how the Ontario Cannabis Store could navigate a potential strike by Canada Post and how Ontario customers could be able to have their cannabis orders fulfilled? Minister. Uh, Minister of Finance, please. Minister of Finance. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Glengarry Prescott Russell for the question. Ontario will be ready in the event of Canada Post Service disruptions. We have made our expectations clear to the Ontario Cannabis Store. They must be ready to continue delivery service in the event of a work stoppage at Canada Post. The Ontario Cannabis Store has been evaluating options to ensure cannabis delivery can continue in the event of a Canada Post strike. 
The OCS has indicated that they have a clear plan and they will be prepared with an alternate delivery process should it be needed. However, in the meantime, we hope the federal government can come to an agreement with the postal workers. Thank you. Next question, the member for Nickel Belt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To the Minister of, of the Environment uh, and Parks. Denome from Hanmer in my riding have paid the deposit on a valid contract signed way before the June 19 deadline to change their windows as they tried to decrease their heating costs. They expected $5,000 rebate from the Green On program. In Sudbury, contractors are racing flat out to complete as many contracts as possible before the October 31st deadline. These contractors don't have time to drive the extra 40, 50 minutes, an hour to come to Nickel Belt because there is so much work to be done in town. Will the minister please agree to extend the deadline so my constituents are not at a disadvantage to get the green Question. rebate simply because they live in rural northern Ontario? Mr. Environment, Conservation and Parks. Mr. Speaker, through you to the member, and thank you very much for the question, and, and I appreciate the situation of your constituents. But when this government was elected, it was elected on the basis of eliminating the cap-and-trade program. The, the responsible thing to do with the elimination of the cap-and-trade program was to wind down the program in a very transparent way, and that is what we've done. Yesterday, the FAO confirmed that our estimates around the wind-up of that program were, were largely accurate. Uh, with regards to the window program, the government set a date of the end of the month in terms of the end of eligibility for that program. We did so so that uh, people who have been participating would have the time to carry, to carry it out, um, but we did so in a very transparent way because we need to be in, bring an end to this program because we brought an end to the funding for this program. We already extended it. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker. This arbitrary deadline is, in effect, discriminating against rural and northern citizens. Yes. The Denomes are not the only one affected. Madame Yvonne Saint-Denis from Red Deer Lake Road, Catherine and Richard Gagné are facing financial loss. So is Sheila Renton. Contractors can work like two or three jobs together when they work in the city, so they are rescheduling my constituents for after the deadline. Many of my constituents are on the verge of losing thousands of dollars, dollars they don't have. So it looks like this PC government is actually taking money out of the pockets of rural and northern residents. Will the minister change the deadline so rural and northern residents don't end up losing big time? Minister. Members, please take your seats. Mr. Minister. Mr. Speaker, through you, through you to the member. Um, this government is in the business of putting money in people's pockets. That's why we got rid of the cap and trade program. That's why we're fighting the Trudeau, the carbon tax. When it comes to northern and rural Ontario, we've taken steps like the expansion of natural gas and others because we understand for the first time the people of rural and northern Ontario in a very long time are seeing a government that understands the issues and they are being responded to by the ministers responsible. Mr. Speaker, we made a commitment to responsibly wind down this program. We are responsibly winding it down. Thank you. Next question, the member for Sault Ste. Marie. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question today is for the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. I know that our government for the people is very excited that this is Local Government Week. This is because we all know that our local governments play a vital role in helping Ontarians. Like the previous Liberal government who failed municipalities downloading costs on them and making it harder for them to work on a day-to-day -day basis, we value our local partners and appreciate all they do for the people across Ontario. I'm particularly proud of the work being done by the city councillors in my riding of Sault Ste. Marie. Their efforts are vital in providing the key services my constituents need. Minister, can you please explain why it is important to have a week like this dedicated to celebrating Ontario's local governments? Mr. Mr. Uh, thanks, Speaker, and I want to thank the uh, member for Sault Ste. Marie for that excellent question. As, uh, as the member said, local governments provide 
the, they're really the closest level of government to the people, and they provide such essential services. I, you know, just to name a few, you have to look at the amount of community centres, things like libraries, the fact that uh, local governments are instilled with making sure the garbage is picked up and the snow is removed from the streets. They provide such a simple, essential services, and Local Government Week gives a wonderful opportunity for us to teach children and students about the different levels of government. We give them the opportunity to understand what local governments do and how they differ between the provincial level of government and the federal level of government. This Local Government Week is even more exciting as Ontarians go to the polls yeah. next week to vote for Fun. representatives at the local level. And in the supplementary speaker, I'll talk more about how we're working with our oh, local government great. partners. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and uh, thank you to the Minister for that excellent answer about the importance of local governments and their critical role in the lives of Ontarians. Our government is clearly committed to listening to Ontario's municipalities and working with them. At the Associ Association of Municipalities of Ontario conference this past August, we had a tremendous turnout from Cabinet and caucus members who held productive meetings with our municipal partners. We also watched you, Minister, as you demonstrated our government's commitment to strong working relationships and uh, <clears throat> by working with AMO by signing a new Memorandum of Understanding. Speaker, would the Minister please explain how we are working with local governments to help them deliver better services and address issues like reducing red tape and building more housing? Thank the member for the question. The member is uh, absolutely correct. This year, at the Association of Municipalities of Ontario conference, the AMO conference, our government had a record number of meetings with our municipal partners, record some 540. He's also correct that I signed the Memorandum of Understanding, the MOU, one year before the renewal date. And I have to tell you, we're continuing our work with AMO. We're going back to, uh, to monthly MOU meetings to listen to their concerns and to proactively work on the issues. Lastly, Speaker, I think it's very important during Local Government Week, I want to take this opportunity to wish everyone running for municipal office our sincere best wishes. We want to thank them for putting their names forward on the ballot. Uh, I, and you know what, Speaker, Order. I have to tell you, I look forward on to deal Spons. with all those newly elected councils in Ontario's 444 municipalities after October 22nd. Start the clock. Next question, the member for University Rosedale. Speaking, my question is to the Minister of Transportation. Riley Peterson travels for three hours in the TTC from her home in Weston to school every day. She could be studying, but instead she's stuck in an overcrowded bus. Commuters like Riley were looking forward to faster and cheaper commutes starting in January when transit riders could pay a new low fare of $3 to ride the GO in the Union Piston Express in Toronto. But now the $3 GO fare program is in jeopardy because it was funded by Ontario's climate plan, a plan that will cost $3 billion to cancel so Premier, the Premier can give favours to big polluters a plan that funded cheaper transit fares so people like Riley could speed up their commute times and pay less. Will the minister tackle congestion by moving forward with the $3 fare program for GO and the Union Pearson Express in Toronto? Minister of Transportation. Well, thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and I thank the, uh, the member for the question. And uh, as she knows, we have made it crystal clear on many occasions in this chamber how committed we are in the Doug Ford PC government to making the transit experience better and more efficient and more enjoyable for people all across the GTHA and, in fact, all across this great province of Ontario. On the issue of the cap and trade, I mean, we also made a commitment in our campaign to cancel that Liberal cash grab and return that money to the people of Ontario. $1.9 billion a year is being taken out of the pockets of the people in the province of Ontario. We're giving it back. But I, I want to assure the member that we are absolutely committed to continuing our job of making transit better all across this province. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Supplementary. Toronto is a world-class city with a world-class transit problem. Our region has the longest commute times in North America, and transit fares are now the highest in Canada. Instead of improving congestion by giving commuters fast and affordable transit, this government is taking us from bad to worse. I'm going to ask the question again. Are you going to move forward with the $3 fare program for GO and Union Pearson Express starting January in Toronto? Minister. Well, I thank the member for that uh, question. Again, I also want to remind her that we have a world-class hockey team in this city as well. You do. Yeah. I, if, when we're prepared to make an announcement on any fair adjustment for GO or the TTC, we will let you. I will let the member know. But we're in the process. We're in the process order. of examining all of the Position costs, benches come line to order. by line, item by item, in this province to see just what kind of mess and how big a mess the previous Liberal government left us, and also to reevaluate all of those promises that they made at a last-ditch effort to try to get re-elected earlier this year. But we're examining everything right across the board, and I can assure the member Bonds. that when we're ready to make an announcement on transit fares across this province, she'll be one of the first to know. Next question. Member for Bruce Gray, Owen Sound. Thank you very much. Speaker, my question is to the government house leader. Oh. I'm proud of our work. Oh. Proud of the work our government has done over its first hundred days. The constituents in my riding appreciate all the work being done for them and for Ontarians all across this great province. I know our government has done a lot to protect our communities and keep Ontarians safe. Can the government house leader inform the legislature on why it was so important to move quickly to deliver real results for the people of Ontario? <laughs> what a great government house leader. Two days in a row, we've got an excellent question from the government whip, and I'm pleased to answer it. You know, as I was going door to door over the constituency week and people were thinking about turkey dinner over Thanksgiving, they were thankful. Here, here. that in the first hundred days that they didn't have a government like the previous one that wasted their money. They were thankful that they didn't have a government like the previous Liberal government that rose gas prices, hydro rates, taxes across the province and took money out of their pockets. They were thankful about that. They were thankful that they had a government that respected their tax dollars here, here. that was trying here, to put here. more money back in their pockets, here, here. Mr. Speaker. Not regressive taxes. They were thankful. They were thankful, Speaker, that they had a government that was making key investments in transportation, all-day go trains, in health care, over 6,000 long-term care beds, Mr. Speaker, and we're just getting started. That concludes the time we have for question period this afternoon. I'm prepared to listen to the point of privilege by the member for Flamborough. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm rising on a point of privilege to address an incident which occurred at the end of debate yesterday. It's my understanding as a new member that in order for a point of privilege to be found, a certain criteria have to be met. Having provided you with notice this morning, as well as the opposition and government house leaders as laid out in Standing Order 21C, I'm now going to articulate how the member from Hamilton Centre breached my privileges as a member with her conduct on the floor of the House yesterday. The first criteria is timeliness. Standing Order 8A states that the House adjourns at 6 p.m. on Tuesdays accepting the last eight days of a sitting, which is on or about the time the incident occurred. As a result, this morning's proceedings were my first opportunity to bring this to your attention, and I delivered notice to the necessary offices this morning in accordance with the standing orders. <coughs> Regarding the incident in question, at the conclusion of debate during the division bells yesterday, the member from Hamilton Centre crossed the chamber and initiated unwanted 
and intentional physical contact with me. At the time, I was sitting on this side of the House, engaged in a conversation with a, a fellow member. In my notice submitted this morning, I referenced two parliamentary authorities on the subject. I would now like to reference two more. Erskine May states on page 262, Members and others have been punished for such molestation occurring within the precincts of the House, whether by assault, insulting, or abusive language, to molest members on account of their conduct in Parliament is also a contempt. It was this rule, which was enforced by Speaker Regan in the Federal House of Commons on May 18, 2016, when the Speaker found that the Prime Minister had committed a similar breach with regard to unwanted and deliberate physical contact of the former member for Leeds Grenville Thousand Islands. That's because Marlowe and Mopiti, the Federal House of Commons Guide for Procedures, states, members are entitled to go about their parliamentary business undisturbed. The assaulting, menacing, or insulting of any member on the floor of the House or while he is coming or going to or from the House, or on account of his behaviour during a proceeding in Parliament, is a violation of the rights of Parliament. Speaker, Speaker Peters found a similar breach occurred in this legislature on May 4, 2010, where he stated, and I quote, this brings me to the nub of the point of privilege raised, that is, the right of members of this Legislative Assembly to attend to their parliamentary duties without interference or obstruction. I note that the House of Commons procedure and practice states the following. In circumstances where members claim to be physically obstructed, impeded, interfered with, or intimidated in the performance of their parliamentary functions, the Speaker is apt to find that a prima facie of privilege has occurred. Speaker, a number of members witnessed the events which occurred yesterday afternoon. Too many, in fact, for this not to be worthy of further examination by the House. And for this reason, I would ask you to find a prima facie case for breach of privilege in this matter. Are there any other... Members, please take their seats. Are there any other members that wish to participate in the discussion on this point of privilege? Member for Timmins. Yeah, Mr. Speaker, the antics displayed by the government members yesterday in trying to block the chamber, uh, the cameras in the chamber, from televising the speech from my leader on a very important health care issue facing Bramptonians was absolutely inappropriate, disrespectful, and beneath the dignity of this House. This point of order has no merit, so let's move on to the important issues that are facing Ontario families, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. I'll consider the matter that's been raised, and I'll report back to the House in due course. I understand that there are some members who want to introduce guests. A member for Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my guests arrived a little bit late, so I'd like to welcome them to the legislature. I have my brother, my sister-in-law, and his, her sister. Thank you. The member for Spadina Port York. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to introduce in the public gallery, although uh, some of them have just left, Margaret Rao and Lyd Adams Adamson from Climate Fast, and my friend, a uh, good friend from Teachers College, James Netzinger, Netzinger, who brought his grade four class from Thorncliff Park Public School today. Thank you. I beg to inform the House that pursuant to Standing Order 98C, a change has been made to the order of precedence on the ballot list for private members' public business such that Mr. Tabins assumes ballot item number 25 and Mr. Vantoff assumes ballot item number 40. This House stands in recess until 3 p.m. this afternoon.